So hello again, I'm uh, JP Bardet, Dean at University of Miami, and uh, I hope that you had the opportunity to visit our beautiful campus just across the golf course. So um, did you know that South Florida has one of the highest rate of entrepreneurship in the United States? Indeed, the Kaufman Foundation ranked Miami uh, the number two metro areas in the nation for entrepreneurship. Uh, just between 2012 and 2014 alone, uh, technology jobs in Miami-Dade County grew by 24% compared to 9% nationally. So the emergence of high-tech innovation is rather new in Miami. This year, will be the fourth time, the fourth edition of Emerge America, a conference which is held in Miami. It started in 2014. Last year, uh, Emerge received 13,000 innovators and investors coming from 80 different countries. So, Miami is really moving on in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, last year, the Cambridge Innovation Center, initially founded in the Boston area, opened a new location at University of Miami Converge Miami Life Science and Technology Park. So in a nutshell, Miami's innovation ecosystems is rapidly transforming. And as many other cities, is likely to face similar challenges and opportunities. So the rapid growth of our innovation ecosystems, the role of research universities, and the challenges and opportunities in Miami's innovation ecosystems are the subject of this panel. So I'm excited to introduce as our panel moderator, Matt Hagman. Matt um, is the uh, program director of the Knight Foundation. Um, he, has, he leads the Knight Foundation's program in South Florida and launched the foundation initiatives aimed at connecting and propelling Miami's emerging entrepreneurs and startups. Um, previously, Matt was an award-winning journalist covering issues of local and national importance. He initially covered legal affairs for the daily business reviews in Miami before moving to the Miami Herald. So he's gonna be the panel moderator and uh, I think we are honored to have Matt here to, uh, to moderate this panel and I think Matt will introduce the rest of the panel. So Matt, I turn it to you. All right, Dean, thank you very much. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you uh, deans, and we're thrilled to have all of you here uh, in Miami. We are well aware that we are the last panel uh, between uh, drinks, so we'll try to make this as engaging as, uh, and lively as we possibly can, but it's a great honor to be here with you and thrilled to have you all here in Miami for several days. As the dean mentioned, uh, there's some really interesting things happening here. I mean, Miami has long been a center of business formation, starting new ventures, uh, but it's increasingly a center of innovation as well. So I'll quickly introduce uh, our panel, and then uh, I am going to be throwing out some questions, but I ask that, uh, that you be thinking of some as well and be turning to you quickly, and hopefully we'll have a really engaging conversation. For the panelists, please feel free to interrupt each other. Uh, disagreeing is always a great thing, so look forward to a great conversation. So going from left to right, uh, I'd like to introduce Nart Natalia Martinez Cal Kalinina. The, uh, uh, Natalia is an organization, organizational psychologist and technologist focused on merging innovation, entrepreneurship, and impact. Her passion hinges on creating communities that are true, inclusive in innovation ecosystems, something that we'll talk about a good bit in our conversation this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon. It's a goal, she says, that is informed by her life as a twice immigrant, 
uh, an interest in cross-disciplinary intersections, fascination with complex systems, and a, and a desire to bridge opportunity gaps. Most recently, as the dean mentioned, Natalia launched the Cambridge Innovation Center here in Miami. Cambridge Innovation Center, as many of you know, has been a real driver in the Boston tech scene for, for many, many years. Uh, and it was this past fall that Cambridge Innovation Center, CIC, launched CIC Miami here under Natalia's leadership. Natalia additionally uh, has, um, uh, has launched uh, and led the awesome foundation Miami here. Uh, she's also been uh, the chief innovation and technology officer for a nonprofit focused on Cuba and building civil society in Cuba, among other things, trying to bring more technology to the island, and bring, use cell phones being one of your efforts to try and build civil society. Uh, she holds a, a BA in psychology uh, and government from Harvard University and an MA in organizational psychology from Columbia. So it's a thrill to have you here, Natalia. Happy to be here. The, uh, moving over, Manny Medina. Uh, Manny is someone uh, who uh, is the founder and managing partner of Medina Capital. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience as a highly successful businessman with expertise in areas including technology, finance, international business, and government. Uh, he has a track record of successfully raising funds, but it's most recently, and Manny is, you know, is best known for uh, building Terramark uh, into a company here in Miami that he sold for $2 billion uh, to Verizon. And subsequent to that, then launched Medina Capital, uh, and then, as the dean mentioned, launched Emerge Americas, which has been a real driver here in Miami, uh, both building, helping build the innovation ecosystem here, but also being a connector uh, across the Americas and bring entrepreneurs uh, and innovators here on an annual basis. And this year will be the fourth year uh, of Emerge Americas, which is so exciting. And before that, Manny was a highly, highly successful uh, real estate developer. Uh, Manny, uh, and before that, Manny was an accountant. Uh, and, uh, and is a graduate of Florida Atlantic University. And last, but certainly not least, Roni Abovitz. Roni is the founder, president, and chief executive officer of Magic Leap. Roni founded Magic Leap in 2011, uh, but was dreaming about such things for most of his life. And it was prior to Magic Leap that he was the co-founder and head of development and technology for Mako Surgical, the world leader in human interactive robotics for orthopedic surgery, Roni was named, uh, which, you know, I don't see it here in the bio, but which was sold uh, for was a billion and a half, a billion four, thereabouts. Uh, so as we talk about, uh, uh, and of course, Mako is a South Florida company. So as we talk about South Florida unicorns, you're sort of, you're looking at it uh, right here on stage. Uh, uh, Roni uh, was named a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum for his work on computer assisted technologies for minimally invasive surgery. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering and an MS in biomedical engineering from uh, right here in Coral Gables, the University of Miami. So uh, with those introductions, what I want to, to, to frame our conversation, and I think you guys, have, you know this probably more than any audience that we could sit in front of, and that's the, the world is changing really, really fast. I mean, there are estimates that, you know, some 40, there's a study with two years ago, 47% of Current jobs in the U.S. Uh, are threatened by AI and automation. Uh, I mean, our, the, what the, we think about things such as, in terms of just real numbers, uh, the biggest job in terms of driving, that's something, whether it's driving a, a bus, a, a truck, whatever it might be, a that is a, an occupation that in the next 10 years may just completely go away. Um, we're in a world that's changing dramatically, and the driver, of course, is technology and innovation. So, to frame our conversation, I'd be curious from each of you, and Roni, I'll start with you, how should we be thinking about sort of this moment that we're heading into, where it feels like every pot, we're in the, the, the top of the first of this dramatic change that's upending one industry after another and changing our lives in, in big, big ways? Sure. Um, if, you, if, we'll, if we just double click on AI and its cousins, machine learning, deep learning, um, I think we're, we're, like, since, like, the 40s, there's always this, it's about to come. In yeah. fact, even, even before, they had mechanical Turks in the, you know, in the 1700s or 1800s. So every generation thinks, like, this is the moment where machines are going to take over, Luddites and the, 
in England in the early 1800s, uh, Marvin Minsky at MIT, it's just around the corner. This actually does feel like uh, there is a substantial change. There is computation power, which uh, 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 not everyone has seen publicly, but if you amass like what Google AI can do and what other companies like that can do, uh, it is pretty powerful, it's pretty intense, and the algorithms and methodology are coming together. So I think engineers have the capacity to solve uh, these issues, but if we don't couple the pure science and technology thrill of just making it happen with a humanistic view of we need to, we need to apply it to make people better, and it's a really key theme. If we're not thinking, uh, if, if you just think I'm just going to do it and I'm just going to replace jobs and it'll sort itself out, I think you'll see like Detroit burning. I yeah. do not think it's going to sort itself out. I think you have to have a conscious effort and a results-based way of measuring progress that we apply these technologies to help people to solve societal problems, to reduce economic imbalance. And if we don't do that, we're actually heading toward disaster. Um, and, and you also need some form of structure I'm not a big fan of governmental structures around this, but uh, like in medicine, they have uh, you know uh, committees that look at the impact of drugs on on things. Uh, the FDA has oversight, but there's also hospital review boards like IRBs. There's nuclear commissions to look at the impact of nuclear weapons. They're not perfect, uh, but AI needs something, some kind of restraint that says you just can't proliferate like a fungus and it'll impact society without any kind of consequence because the consequences are there. And I think as a responsible engineer, you really need to think about what am I doing, what's the impact on the community around me, and how can I actually help people and not just displace them randomly and hope for the best. I, I think you have to have a conscious going forward. Manny, how do you see what we're walking into? I mean, do you share Roni's thoughts here in particular that top of mind needs to be that the, these new tools and technologies we need to be really intentional, that they need to be about helping people? Yeah, look, I totally 100% agree, obviously, with most of the, uh, what Ronnie said. Uh, and I believe that uh, innovation, you cannot stop, right? And this is why when, when we fought Uber from coming to Miami, you know, I was one of the first ones to say, you're not, you're not going to win. You're never going to win because eventually innovation wins. I, the part that I don't agree with Ronnie is that I don't think the ethical aspect of it alone makes it because you're not going to stop. Today, the world is so interconnected that you got a bunch of kids in Buenos Aires, in, in Czech, you got people in China, all trying to think of the next thing, right? And you're not gonna ethically say, don't do that. So I think what, every, every time that we've had a disruption of this magnitude in our history, uh, believe it or not, and I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm very light on regulations, but it's really up to government to be able to help mitigate the impact. And whether it was creating jobs or the highway program by Eisenhower or what's, you know, in the industrial revolution, everything that they did, it's, you gotta have some kind of a cushion because if not, I do agree with Ronnie 100%, you're gonna have revolutions. What's happening today, I mean, in, 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 in countries today where, where, and I use Uber because it's one of the most disruptive technologies that we've seen. Not only people think Uber is disrupting taxis, they're not. Uber is disrupting the automobile industry in general. I mean, I think that basically, you know, my kids, they don't ever drive anymore, right? I mean, I remember when I, when I was growing up, I got my restricted license at 15. I couldn't wait to be 16. That's just not the case anymore. So, so this disruption, so you, you're having these drivers really angry and mad and burning cars and, and hurting people. And listen, if I was at, you know, I, I understand the disruption. So I think we've got to have this ability for us to be able to mitigate that with, uh, with the help of government, unfortunately, you know, it's not somewhat functional, but, but uh, that will be a, you know, a, a good way for us to, uh, to be able yeah. to mitigate it, because by itself, it, it will not cure itself. Natalia, I'm curious. So, you know, in CIC here in Miami, are you finding that, you know, with the, the entrepreneurs in the space, these are people with, in most cases, very early stage ventures. Uh, are they having these conversations? Are they thinking about, you know, how our world is changing so quickly, and if we're not really smart about how we manage this, this can take us into a very difficult place? Um, I think, so I think it varies. As you mentioned, I think if you're talking to folks who are in the earlier stages of their ventures, they're generally very focused on, as, as I think we can all imagine, very focused on just yeah. being able to survive and prove their concept and make it past the next three months and the next six months and the next year. But I do think there is, um, kind of aside from that, I do think there is a, a conversation happening in the entrepreneurship and in the innovation sector around some of the larger themes that are emerging. 
I think the topic of, for example, collaboration is coming up a lot, uh, and I mean that in more than one sense. I agree with Manny that I think kind of this idea of how the public and the private sector gets bridged, how it collaborates and how it facilitates each other is a big piece. Um, institutional kind of engagements, and so I think you, you're starting, I, I work very closely with the University of Miami and I feel very privileged to do so. They're one of our primary partners. So we also see a lot of these conversations where people are asking, well, so I'm working on something, but how do I engage with the university institutions and the academic entities in my city or my region or my state? Uh, are there resources that I can pull from that? Are there ways that I can engage or that they can engage with me? So that, I think that dynamic of collaboration has been generally unclear and people are starting to ask those questions. Same thing for the public sector. Um, I think what you also hear a lot of are kind of starting to engage a lot more around this idea of cross-pollination. I think we, we know a lot of examples of successful cross-pollination across industry verticals or topics, um, but I don't think we've made a habit of that, not just in Miami, but in general. I think that's something that is starting to be discussed much more openly, this concept of innovation, not just by invention, but by translation, and what that actually means and how that requires collaboration and actual conversation across different topics, different entities, corporate startups, academic stakeholders, students. Um, I think there's, we're starting to understand that there needs to be a much more holistic conversation about where it is that we want to drive our societies forward and that we cannot just single-handedly as kind of the innovation sector pull the rest of the train behind us. It has to be a collaborative effort. Yeah. And that's a pretty complicated and you know, system to crack and to map out. And certainly that's not the case in the primary centers of innovation today right, right now. Roni, I'd love to dig in on this a little bit more. So as, as an entrepreneur, you're building a new venture right now. What sort of constraints would you want placed on you around sort of doing good for humanity? I mean, is it, is it just sort of, as you put it, sort of, sort of a cultural one, that the shared values that we continually talk about at gatherings like this? I mean, the, the idea of having government getting in is it necessary? It's also scary because you wonder where does that really go when government begins to curb innovation. Um, but as you point out, it can take us to some, some, uh, some scary places. So how do we find this balance? Yeah, if you ask me what constraints do I want some unknown party to put on me, I'd probably right. say none. No. <laughs> um, we're internally putting constraints upon ourselves, but yeah. that's not a very universal objective thing. But uh, we are trying to set the tone on, on what are the cultural values that seem to be um, the right balance between uh, technology and people, uh, and put people first, people in the center, uh, put like privacy, security, um, uh, literally anything we do in AI and machine learning, what we do is like if it doesn't help people, we shouldn't do it. If it doesn't amplify you and make you smarter, we shouldn't do it, but that's self-imposed on our company. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you can get all companies to sort of agree to do things this way other than to get cultural societal pressures um, or have some kind of like emergency line government regulations, but they, they tend to not do the thing you want them to do and they tend to add all kinds of bureaucracy that's irrelevant. So yeah, and that's I, the part that scares me. Yeah. And I don't think, I, I, I don't mean regulatory in the sense of, you know, regulations of what you can and cannot do because it just doesn't work right in today's world. Yeah. I'm thinking that how, from a, from a monetary point of view, to help mitigate the impact. You know, if you're going to all of a sudden have, you know, 500,000 people that can't drive anymore, you know, you've got to financially help those people to be able to get to the next stage, not just with education, but with some kind of a subsidy, something where the society absorbs as a whole the impact because that innovation there's, I don't care what government regulates or what you self-impose, you're just not going to stop it. Yeah. It's going to happen, right? So basically, is when, and then when you see, the problem is that we are reactionary when it comes to, uh, so I didn't mean from a regulatory point of view imposing regulation. I meant just, you know, kind of mitigating the impact, right? So. Well, if, if I may add to that, I think the, the levers that hypothetical institutions or government entities can pull to push, to nudge toward what we want as opposed to, to pull us away from the things that they don't want us to do are much more effective avenues and we don't pull on those as frequently. Uh, so whether it is investing in educating, uh, preemptively investing in educating our workforce that we predict is going to be unemployed or investing, actively investing in businesses that kind of work on particular issues in a particular manner, incentivizing, I think incentivizing the patterns that we want society and corporations to mimic, um, as opposed to trying to limit the patterns that they're going to do, is a, it can be a better use of both our funds and our time. You know, you talked about sort of the, the, the social dislocation and how the 
people, jobs will be lost. Are things like universal basic income things that we should be, be talking about now? I mean, you certainly don't hear it in, uh, in conversations among politicians. Well, listen, things. you know, I mean, but I don't should know. Should we about, begin to be driving that conversation? I don't know about universal basic income because I, I think that would just, I mean, I don't know how. You can't agree on anything. How could you ever agree on something? <laughs> that would be like, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's a little bit uh, far out there. But I do believe that without going that broad, and, you know, that big where everybody makes money or gets an income by staying home, I think there's, there's middle ways, you know, where you can begin subsidizing. You know, people as they transfer, you know, by giving them stipends and, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know there's tax uh, incentives that you can give in order for you to be able to spend in a certain way and certain another way. So, I mean, it's a big purse that the government has. And it basically, and it's really is being able to how you direct it to be able to mitigate this without having people burning the, the, the city up. Because that's what you do when you don't have food and, you know, table and, you know, and health care and stuff like that. That's exactly what happens, right? And this disruption is, is, is accelerating at a pace that I have never seen yeah. and, 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 and read about. It's just happening very, very quickly. I think the biggest difference from when I started my career to what is happening right now, and I think there's no better proof than, 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 than obviously, Ronnie and, and, uh, and, and what they're doing is that this is happening at very, very fast. We own a, a machine learning company that we acquired three years ago. And just what, we, what our development team, one of the companies, what our development team has been able to do internally in the last 36 months, it, it, it boggles my mind, right? Just the, 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 uh, the capacity, and that's not gonna stop. Right now, what you're gonna have is you're having law firms adapting this uh, uh, software and not using the traditional middle ground. So that's eliminating hundreds, if not thousands of jobs of people that were doing this before. And this is everywhere, in every industry. I don't care what industry it is. You're having this, this disruption in employment. You think that, that our issues today are because of, uh, and I'm not getting political here, but uh, uh, with, with, with trade in Mexico or, or, you know, or, or visas, our issue is technology. It's our only issue. It's happening here, it's happening everywhere else. And unless you, you mitigate that, this is when you have revolt, right? So. You know, it, it seems like in so many conversations, there's sort of you have a stopwatch, and how long does it take for the conversation, dinner, or whatever, until you get to politics, because it always seems to find its way these days into a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Roni, do you have a view on this, on things like universal basic income, or the sort of the, the social dislocations that are coming, and is it entrepreneurs that need to be the ones who are leading the discussion and how we grapple with it? I will, I will not comment on universal <laughs> basic income. Um, I will say the social dislocation, though, is something we, we do talk about in the company because the, the percentage of people at the top that are well-educated, understand tech, is unfortunately getting smaller. So how do you democratize uh, devices and democratize access to technology and information and education? If you could democratize like learning how to cope in the, in the tech world, if you could democratize like, I would rather have universal basic learning yeah. where you learn skills that are actually needed. Like a friend of mine runs, um, uh, you know, company out in California that basically teaches uh, people like micro degrees very quickly, things that you need. So you'll have to rapidly re-educate, uh, um, you know, like, like Udacity, you'll have to rapidly re-educate people when they lose their job as a, as a driver for something like Uber, what do you do next? Um, and you can't just drop, drop them on the floor and say you'll be a coal miner, like, or paint yellow stripes on the, on the cement. Like, that's not a, a forward-looking job. So the rapid re-education is something that companies who are doing the displacing should be thinking about, too. Um, and it's something we think about a lot, because, um, how, like, how can what we're building help people um, just be smarter along? Like, our, our bet is people plus the AI are much better than the AI or people alone. And that, I think that curves gives us a, a few more decades um, in, in order for people to cope with all this change. And how do you integrate those two things together? And how do you make it so that it's a real learning and you're not just uh, like a, a biologic meat puppet, which I think would sort of be the worst case, where the, the AI is so much past your capability, you're just being told, do this, do this, do this, versus absorbing information and actually learning and, uh, and, and developing some skills. So I, th I think that the dislocation is a problem. Uh, if you don't think about it, it's a big mistake. Um, and I, I do think some companies like look at like mobile devices as the basic unit that everyone in the world will need some kind of mobile device from which they'll do most things. Um, and if you go from there, that does democratize access, but then how much can you start to pour in through that and as those platforms get better, how do you start to help people improve their lot in life? I think if a tech company doesn't think about that, you're, 
you're missing something. Uh, you're missing social good, you're missing economic upside too. I tell you, I mean, this, here in Miami, in our sort of collective efforts to build the innovation ecosystem here, been very, very intentional about trying to leverage the, our, our community's unique diversity. Miami is a place actually where over half the population was born outside the U.S. than in, and thinking that sort of innovation ultimately was built on a diversity of people and ideas connecting and colliding. I mean, do, Mattel, do you want to speak to that, this whole idea of, as Roni put it, um, uh, um, uh, 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 democratizing tech, I think is how you put it. Um, in terms of efforts here. I mean, how you think about that at CIC? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, you're doing work in Overtown, for example, engaging residents in Overtown. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we are in Overtown. Yeah. Um, kind of the, uh, the, uh, one of our core guiding principles is figuring out how we create a place of convergence between the health district here, which is the second largest health district in the country, second only to Houston, kind of the, what I call the innovation corridor, so Wynwood and downtown and Brickell, and the actual neighboring community, so Overtown, Alapata, the areas of Wynwood that aren't included in this kind of innovation hype. And so how do all of these things dovetail around each other? And it's a very complicated, I would say it's not even a complicated equation, I would say there's no equation in which they fully dovetail together. Um, Part of the framework that I use for kind of thinking through this and for engaging when we look at it from the lens of CIC is that technology and innovation as we know and as, as Manny and as Ronnie have talked about is not linear, right? We, we're watching this pace of growth and trajectories kind of leapfrog and really just engage at, at the speed that, is, that has different curves. It's not a linear process. But normally we think of social solutions and of kind of infrastructure and guided kind of interventions, we think of them in a very linear way. And those two things are not only currently not aligned, but they are going to continue to be compounded in their misalignment when technology continues to move at a very rapid pace. And our solutions for inclusion and uh, engagement, the workforce and re-educating the workforce are all kind of going in this very linear incremental manner. That gap just widens. So we think of it in the case of Overtown, for example, it's a community that has, um, you know, not even touching on topics like re-education, it has massive digital divide issues. There are, there are large swaths of the community that do not have access to internet. Yeah, so homes how do you, without internet. Right, so how do you even, you know, in order to work on that problem, you can't think linearly. You have to think in the same leapfrog type pattern that would use to, that you would think to think about innovation or entrepreneurship. Because you're talking about people who do not have internet in their home, and you're trying to think about how you would maybe re-educate them to work in a world where AI has taken over a portion of the workforce in 15 years. That is a giant leap. There's no way that by that thinking about it in a linear incremental format, you will get there in any way that will be in time. Yeah. So we're, we've been talking about how technology is going to change our, our lives so much and, and, and change uh, jobs. But let's think about sort of right now. Um, in a lot of ways, I'd be curious, to get your, in a lot of ways, one could argue that there's not a problem with number of jobs out there right now in technology. It's finding people who can work in those jobs. I would be curious to find out if that's the case, and here is we're in a, an audience of beans of engineering schools. Um, what do you think, what are ways to actually sort of create a talent pool, to better create a talent pool, um, to serve the sort of ventures that you're involved in, the talent that you're seeking? Roni, do you wanna? So uh, let, let me lay out the problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the inventory of the people we're going to hire coming out of a lot of the folks who are here. So one, um, just poor diversity stream. Uh, the number of, like, for example, women going into tech colleges, graduating and just available are almost a one to five ratio. Now, there's some schools that are one to three or some are, are actually evenly balanced, but on average I think it's, it's pretty poor. So if you're a company trying to build a balanced and diverse workforce, they're just not coming out of the schools. So you have to go all the way upstream and say, why aren't they coming into the university? You have to go to high school, middle school, elementary school. Um, I think that is a major issue because if you don't have a balanced uh, workforce, then you're not designing for the world. The world is actually diverse and balanced. Uh, so one of, the, one of the key things for us is how do we find the most talented people and have the right mix? Because you're, you, want, you want design for men and women and people of all races and, and colors and religions. So I think that's one problem. The other thing is all of the, the, the immigration and visa issues. Like, you sometimes just don't have anyone in America who's uh, capable of certain roles. And then you find someone from another country that wants to come here. They want to immigrate here and live here and take that job. And now it's like the bar just got even worse. So instead of coming here, that super talented person with a PhD who will settle here and help the economy here is going to go somewhere else. 
They're going to go stay in China. They'll stay in India. And in fact, because it's made so miserable for them, they're going to pull their friends out and they're going to build startups over there and pull them out of here. So we'll have a brain drain away from the U.S. because we made it like hard and sometimes hostile. Uh, that's all incredibly bad. Like we want the best talent in the world coming here like we've had for the last couple hundred years and making it really tough for the smartest people to show up. Uh, that, that makes no sense at all. Like, I think most of my friends in tech would probably agree. Like, you have a brilliant person who wants to immigrate here, bring their family, raise the economy by being here and having a positive impact and make it hard for them. They get disgruntled, they go get capital somewhere else, pull people out. So I think that's, that's one major issue. And the other one is uh, we really need to pull um, uh, you know, people from like, early school into universities and make it a warm climate university to be, uh, whether it's gender or race, uh, to kind of be tech, tech enabled so that uh, you have a much better uh, pool of talent uh, that's balanced and, and healthy in companies. Uh, right now, like, we'll get like 90 to 1 ratios, 100 to 1 ratios for some roles that make no sense. Not happening in other countries. Like in China, you might have as many women uh, as men, sometimes even more, applying for tech jobs. Wow. This is a U.S. cultural problem. Uh, like in optics engineering, you'll find like a ton of women in China, very few in America. And the one you do are like people who came from China to the United States to study. So we have some kind of like an anti-tech societal climate, I don't know where it starts in high school or middle school, that devalues people who are smart. Um, and maybe that's changing, but it sort of led to a social stigma of being a tech or science geek or science fair person, um, which is somehow not happening in other countries where it's a virtue. These are, these are real issues, for, and, and by preventing the best and brightest from coming here becomes very, very complex. It forces uh, companies to go outside the U.S. and form entities outside the U.S. to get the brain talent, and I think you'll see the big tech companies doing that. So we need to change the valves um, on multiple levels to, to be much healthier for the next few decades. Yeah. Sorry, that's not an answer. Uh, no, that was positive, a but terrific it, answer. That was a terrific answer. Manny, I mean, you, when you were building Terramark, uh, and now, I you know, I didn't mention in Manny's introduction, Manny is now launching a new venture, uh, which as of yet, na soon to be named uh, uh, venture um, uh, that, uh, that he will, well, I would rather have you describe it, uh, but valued at some 2.8 billion. Uh, but why don't you briefly describe what's going to be, what you're, you're, what you're launching, and then be curious as you think about this new venture that you're launching, how do you think about talent? So the new venture is uh, we're very involved, have been for the last 20 years in cybersecurity. So we invest a lot in cybersecurity. We, we believe, and I personally believe, that one of the biggest threats of this revolution that is going on right now in every facet is cyber. Uh, we've lived in a world that is really, really dangerous and is becoming more dangerous by the day. Uh, it used to be that, uh, that, that uh, enemies, they would come in and, and, and penetrate and try to steal something from you. What is happening today is that they come in and they destroy what you have uh, just, just to do damage. And that is becoming easier. Uh, the entire topography of how the Internet works today, the Internet was not designed to do what it's doing now. It's basically the way it was designed and the, and the security around it is extremely complicated because it's like if you build a house and then later on you decide to put air conditioning and later on you decide to put electricity. It's all been, so this is, it's almost impossible for you to defend yourself. So we invest and do a lot. The new venture uh, is, a, a, is a venture that we've done uh, to create a secure infrastructure um, for information technology for uh, large enterprises and, and government agencies. So suffice it at that. Uh, but we do hire a lot of highly sophisticated folks. I got to tell you, it has really, really changed in Miami. Uh, when I founded my previous company and it was headquartered here, uh, and uh, for us to attract uh, uh, number one draft picks uh, in cybersecurity, what is a number one draft pick? Uh, MIT or Stanford graduate, uh, 10 years in an intelligence uh, agency, now going over to the, to the, to the, to the, to the private side. That number one draft pick uh, didn't think of Miami as a, and that has really changed a lot. And that has really changed a lot because of the uh, effort that everybody's put here. So, and, and one of the biggest issues was talent. So talent really helped us create this, I mean, and, and, and fuel this effort. All of us, the Knight Foundation, everybody here, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the folks said, let's change Miami because we have one distinctive advantage. And this, uh, you know, Maurice's father, 
uh, uh, was mayor, uh, our fourth panelist who will show up sometime, uh, he, uh, he, he was mayor of Miami for many years. And he said, you know, in Miami, uh, we can really screw up anything except our geography. <laughs> so basically, we have a great geographic advantage because we have Latin America, and we're the capital of Latin America, literally the capital of Latin America. So we, you have a significant advantage. So basically, in order for us to create this talent, it, it, was a, it was difficult, right? Because everybody wanted to come here. You didn't have, you know, the right talent. So we did, uh, we said, let's go out and change. And it's been phenomenal. I mean, like, like we were talking about a little earlier. It, now it's real, right? What is happening is just really, really real. So talent is easier today. Now, when we started, I began going to every university. You couldn't get a cyber degree down here. That's crazy, right? You couldn't get a big data degree. AI, that is all changed. The universities have all pulled together. They've come in, and now, you know, starting all the way from Palm Beach, now obviously you got the whole state from Palm Beach down, it's changed a lot. So we are seeing a lot of fresh talent being bred here. It's not at the level, obviously, that we would like it to be. Engineering schools really need to do a much better job of those highly sophisticated degrees that, uh, that, 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 uh, that we all need, but it's beginning to change. And what is also beginning to change is the perception. That number one draft pick now thinks of Miami because Miami has a lot of distinct advantages for you to come here. Uh, and, and so that is changed. And it's not where we want it to be, but certainly it's light years away from where it used to be, where you it was really, really uh, 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 very difficult. And I, I, I could not agree with you, Ronnie, with Ronnie Moore. One of the things is, look, when you were in Argentina or in Sao Paulo or, 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 or Bogota, entrepreneurs, they want to succeed. And their dream is to come here. This is really their dream. It used to be to come to Palo Alto or to come to, to the valley, anywhere in the valley. Uh, it's really changed. They, we, because we, we see it and we, we were inundated by them. I'm sure that Natalia and Ronnie, you're seeing it. So they want to come here. Now it's a real issue with the visas. And it's really become a, a big impediment, right? So we're actually seeing them stay back in Buenos Aires or stay back in Sao Paulo because the issues are so big. So what are they doing? They're creating, you know, this, these guys are creating very successful companies. And, uh, and we're not, <laughs> you know, it's, we, we really are cutting off our own... Uh, our own uh, uh, yeah. ability for us to be able to, to, to nurture that. And that's everywhere, right? And it affects, obviously, uh, uh, all of us. So I, I agree 100%. Well, Natalia, I want to pick up on that with, uh, on two points. One is Manny's point about number one draft picks. You're a number one draft pick. You out of Columbia and Harvard and chose to come to Miami and make this your home. Interested to learn why. And also, you're a twice immigrant, as, as, as I mentioned in your biography. Be interested to hear about that. Sure. Um, one of the things, just before I forget it, because I had a thought on something that, that both of you said, um, in terms of looking at the at the talent pool, I think we, we have some outdated frameworks that we still use, and we think of kind of generalists versus specialists, when what we really need to be producing are specialists, but who think creatively, um, who are able, who are exposed and enlightened about other topics and other fields, who can come up with kind of interesting and creative applications and, cr and kind of leap between things. But this framework of you're a generalist or a specialist and if you're one then you're not the other I think is, is outdated and we're still applying it. Um, in terms of my case, so I was living in New York, I lived in the Northeast for at that point 10 years and I was lured down here by a job offer that I felt uh, was too good to pass up. I was working for Ultimate Software. They are a $5 billion software development firm based in Broward. They produce HR, kind of a whole suite of HR software, and being an organizational psychologist, it was an interesting foray into the world of technology. Um, it presented an opportunity that I, I didn't think I, a person of kind of my, I'd had great experiences and I had worked in the corporate world and I felt you know, capable, but I don't think I had ever, no, nobody in New York or Boston or DC would have given me that job. And so it, I was leading one of their strategic pillars and I was surrounded by people who had many years more experience on all of the technical side, but didn't have kind of the complement kind of psychological knowledge that I was coming from and had never kind of worked in those corporate environments. So that's what lured me here. What has kept me here um, has been looking at the fact that Miami is going through such a period of adolescence, and I mean that in the best of ways. We're, um, you know, we're a bit hormonal, as teens tend to be, but we're working through that, and I think I'm excited to see what kind of city we grow into being, and I feel fortunate to work on that. So that has kept me here. Um, in terms of... <laughs> Being an immigrant twice over, hello. In terms of being an immigrant twice over, I was uh, born in Cuba, I lived there until I was six, and then my family immigrated to Mexico, largely because anyone who, most people who can try to, who can leave Cuba, do leave Cuba. 
And we lived in Mexico for a handful of years, loved it, but found that it was not a climate that was very hospitable to immigrants. And so we came to the US uh, for my own, I'm an only child, so for my own kind of progress and development, and also because the US allowed my parents a, a host of different opportunities, both kind of, most of them economic, that a country like, like Mexico did not allow, um, or made very obstacled and very difficult for Im recent immigrants. I want to welcome Maurice Frey Jr. Maurice, thank you for coming to give our closing remarks for the panel. Okay. So, <laughs> open the bar. <laughs> so uh, Maurice is the CEO of Inside Tech. He's also a board member of Endeavor Miami, uh, where, and Miami is actually Endeavor's first uh, U.S. affiliate. Uh, and then prior to that, uh, Maurice was the co-founder with Roni of Mako Surgical, where they built uh, Mako Surgical uh, together before having a, uh, a really remarkable uh, sale that has, uh, uh, that has had a remarkable ripple effect. Which I don't think that story has yet been sort of told as well as it could be, the number of companies that have been launched as a result of what you built with Mako. But Marisa, what I want to turn to you on is this whole idea of, um, of how, while there are primary centers of innovation in the world, um, the genie is starting to come out of the bottle a bit, right? And we're seeing other centers of innovation begin to emerge. We've been talking about, uh, talking about Miami. Um, when you and Roni were building Mako, um, you made a very conscious decision, you know, when you were um, actually encouraged, maybe that's even not strong enough to move, uh, to build your company here. Um, talk about that experience, but talk about what we're seeing now, as in more and more places. I mean, here we have deans from cities across the US and their efforts in many, many cities to build their innovation ecosystems there about how we're seeing sort of these new uh, uh, startup communities and innovation ecosystems build. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. Oh, can you? Uh... Um, okay, here we go. First of all, thank you. I apologize. I was actually up at University of Florida, Roni, talking to the, uh, the guys uh, giving, giving uh, tributes to uh, David Day Who's, who's a remarkable tech transfer at the University of Florida. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's apropos because um, in just engineering programs across the board, um, I'm also on the board of Boston University and um, dealing with issues about innovation and within universities and, and how to attract university students and, and programs and what's the best for the universities. So, and what's the best for the programs and how do we accelerate? Obviously, we've seen tremendous success out on the West Coast with some of the uh, larger universities like Stanford. And the question is, can you, can you replicate that? And um, I live in a world where um, kind of defied gravity, um, but kind of the universe where I live is between San Francisco and Tel Aviv, because uh, those are the two innovation hubs. Yeah. And, um, and I'm a strong believer that, um, that you, can be, you can create your own reality, that you can create your own uh, direction and you just, it's just, the resilience works. If, if it's so obvious, everyone gravitates there. And yeah, it's like, you, you could probably be luckier, but I remember, Roni, the days that, um, you know, we went off to uh, other, uh, to Iowa and to other universities across the country, not, not the obvious ones, to, to, to gain, to get talent. And, uh, and that, was, that was really, really key. Uh, in terms of building companies and c creating innovation. Um, you know, our story here in, in Miami, um, yeah, we were a couple times asked to move. One, one time we went out to, to uh, Canada and the government of Canada wanted to give us $100 million to move. Uh, but I think we stuck it out here in Florida and uh, we committed to, to Florida and we're committed to the universities. You know, I, just to build on the point, on talent, tell me if I'm remembering this correctly. Did you, when you were hiring, did you not actually rule out sort of the, what are the, the usual suspects and instead we're yeah. going to places like University of Alabama or University of Texas, not, go, not thinking to go, well, we're gonna go to Stanford or Harvard, is that? We did, yeah. we did. We, we actually, yeah, Alabama was one of the targets that we had. Um, but, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's, I think a good story um, and, and telling a good story and, and making people be part of that journey is what's really key. And especially with today's engineers that are coming out of your schools, I, I think that you, you have to kind of give them, I, I would encourage 
the engineering departments across the country to engage with industry, engage in great stories, in great, in, and, and some of these uh, innovative exponential technologies um, and, and look beyond what is the obvious, beyond, beyond what is, is, is there. Try to see where this is going and, and, um, and you'll see that, that uh, your students will get engaged in it, the program should get engaged, and there's a lot of opportunities to get jobs. Roni, I, I can on this question of you know, where we do our thing, you know, where we launch our, um, now you've twice launched businesses here in South Florida. If you could just bring us into the, the thinking about why you chose to do that, particularly the second time around, you could have done it absolutely anywhere. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of an irrational adventure to do it yeah. here. Uh -huh. Um, but uh, having done it a few times now, there, there are some very justifiable reasons. One, um, when we, we recruit talent from, a lot, from out of the state a lot, um, we, so we change the economic impact of people coming into our city and county and all that in the South Florida. Uh, so I think there's, there's reception from the state uh, about just bringing all these talented people from around the world. I think that's one. But, it's, it's a little bit like going to the moon, like you went to, you went to Cocoa Beach, you went to Cape Canaveral, and that's what you did. Um, when you pull someone out of the valley or they come from somewhere else, you're committed to doing this thing that you came here for, uh, so that you get, you get more focus and you have more loyalty uh, when you sort of come to the main hub, and I really like that. Plus, Florida's like a white space. I mean, Walt Disney came here and just saw a dream in the swamp, and we went to the moon in a, like a dusty beach, so there, there are some like very big things that happen here that people forget about. Um, I think the other piece is that uh, there's now real stuff. Uh, we, we called it, the, there is a there there. Yeah. Uh, I now tell people, you know, the images of alligators and anacondas and stuff is really wrong. Although, I, you know, I live near the Everglades now, so there are <laughs> and pythons and such. But, uh, you know, the design district, the, the universities, UM, FIU, FAU, Nova, um, what, what Manny's doing at the eMERGE, there's real stuff happening, the Miami lab, and it's, it's kind of turning into a cooler space than, let's say, being in San Francisco or the Bay Area or San Diego or even Austin, because it's new. And it's new and bubbly, and there's that fresh sense of ad adventure and excitement. And it's not just talk anymore. There really is something palpable in the air. And more and more of the people we bring in are like actually feeling that. They're going, there's like world-class stuff uh, beginning to show up that w wasn't here when we were doing Mako. Uh, yeah. It was beginning, it was beginning, but now there's that, that sense of something happened. It feels like Seattle in the early days of grunge, you know, where everyone's about to get signed or something. <laughs> um, you know, but you know, I, it, does, it does have this palpable there-ness, yeah. uh, which is really helping us a lot. Yeah, it's exciting. And by the way, in the, just speaking as one person, just in the specific Magic Leap context, I can think of five people who I've met who live, I'd say, about three miles from where my wife and I live, and it's two from New York, one from LA, two from LA, one from San Francisco, all. Who've moved. Yeah, who've moved and are now here. Okay, Manny, did you want to weigh in on No, what I was going to say is I think there's no better example than Emerge Americas, right? I mean, basically, Emerge Americas was an idea to create this platform to bring uh, innovation, technology, what's happening today, f and put it together, focus on Latin America, Europe, and North America, that triangle, right, that so many companies are part of. It didn't exist. And in our wildest dreams, uh, Matt was part of this from day one, right? When I really, uh, from the very, very beginning, and we began thinking, okay, how, we did it at the convention center, the Miami Beach Convention Center, and it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. In our wildest dreams, we never expected to have, in the third year, we were sold out. We had to literally close uh, because we, we had 13,000 people, 80 countries, it's crazy. One of the things that also, by the way, to your point about women, two years ago, uh, we, uh, the, uh, the, the team at Emerge came up with the idea to, to have a track only for women innovators. And uh, to my very big surprise and pleasant surprise, last year, 34% of the attendees were women. And, that, that, and a lot of them young and from all over the world. So that was really, really cool to be able to have that so many women innovators. So I think, I think that growth uh, is not because of what, you know, we, we created the platform, but the need was there. So that's to, to Ronnie's point, it's, it's real. People are really, really here thinking Miami tech. People coming here, staying, doing business, you know, all the big companies that you can think of, you know, everybody coming and, and doing, selling their wares, universities, et cetera. So it's because it's real now. And I'm, I am very, very pleased uh, that it is because I think once it catches, it's kind of irreversible, right? And that's, that's, that's where we are right now. 
still adolescent, hormonal problems, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know with a with a with a with a with a real um, uh, ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to give the opportunity for questions. So, I, and I and so I see a hand already. Go Is there a microphone, Dean, that's uh, going around, or should people just? Yeah, there's a microphone. Hi, th thanks for the uh, panel. That's very interesting. I'm from Denver, not so much hormonal, it may be because of uh, the legalization of weed, I'm not sure, but, <laughs> but equally exciting. Uh, my question for the panel is the prospective intersection and particularly ideas that you've seen to intersect your industrial interests and young research-oriented tenure-track faculty. They're, they're increasingly challenged to continue that path with federal funding. They need other sources, but they still have to publish in order to advance their careers. Are you seeing any creative ways to connect your interests to that, that group? Roni? Yeah, we have a um, internal, we have a program we call N plus one, which is, uh, I think we're calling it now the Office of Advanced Technology and Science. But we realize to keep the best and brightest around, we have to collaborate with the university, we want to sponsor research, we have to allow scientific publication. Uh, so as a startup, uh, that itself is a startup within our startup. But uh, this idea of this N plus one notion is to really uh, encourage that. And we realize more and more, uh, you know, hopefully with, with, with some help we can become really successful. It'll probably be more in companies like us uh, and private tech companies to fund research that the government's shutting down and to house data that the government's deleting. Um, and I do think we see scientists and researchers coming to us as looking at like, we're safe harbors for thought and intellectual discourse where that's getting lost uh, at the government level. So I, I, do, I do see some of my, my, my uh, colleagues in other tech companies feeling a similar way. Uh, and I think part of it, you just want to advance the general notion of, of scientific thinking. So I'm all for it. We have a little startup inside Magic Leap, the N plus one, to make that happen. Uh, I think it's also critically important for the universities to begin thinking or quickly change their minds and thinking that government is you know, he's not gonna be there. So for example, uh, the new president of the University of Miami, he came down and he says, look, one of the most important things is to have a real research university, and that takes a lot of money. So he's really become the number one fundraiser, right? And, and gone out and, you know, personally really been a tremendous amount of success in, in luring, because I think there's tremendous interest in being able to help. But I mean, uh, universities, well, I know you, I don't mean this, I'm, I'm generalizing, but typically is rather than waiting for the grant, you know, there's a lot of private interest in being able to help. It just takes a lot of effort, like, you know, the lady before saying, you know, it's tenacity <laughs> to go out and get it. Because I think having that research component, it, if we're going to be successful to, in, in, in a long-term basis, that research component is critical for our ecosystem. So, you know, we, we have uh, funded or um, involved with, I would say, over the last five years, about $100 million of funding that's gone to the universities and across the world in terms of what we do. So we, we do a lot of work with universities. Our lifeblood is working very closely with universities. Um, the NIH is, is clearly a concern if, if this budget goes down. I think it's gonna have a, a horrible impact across all universities and I hope to God that it doesn't happen. Um, and, and I think there's good signs that it won't. Um, that being said, that being said, I would say one of the models, and I've traveled around and I've seen, I work with a lot of different universities across the board. One of the most impressive models that I've seen with a relationship with industry is in Munich, at the Technical University of Munich, Munich TUM. And what's really neat about what they've done in their model is that they have given uh, their professors the, the green light on IP to go off and start companies. And what they've done around the campus is actually Large, large, uh, large corporations have come in, obviously with the automotive industry, like BMW, General Electric, all these, all these guys are, are all, they set up their innovation centers or hubs around the university. They attract the, they attract the doc, the, uh, these, the, 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 the researchers and the engineers. The researchers go off and start off their little companies and it feeds into the program. For, and, and I think that, that um, you know, universities need to be thinking more like that. I know it's very challenging because at the end of the day, it's risk. 
And universities look at this as real risk, and, and it's a real challenge. Um, but I think that there's, there's more and more examples, and, and I would encourage you guys to look at those types of examples. Um, if I may, uh, kind of two very specific, speaking of examples, two very specific examples. Um, so CAC, aside from being in Cambridge, Boston, and in Miami, first between coming, before coming to Miami, we went to St. Louis. And there we collaborate very closely, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with St. Louis University, Washington University, and the University of Missouri, there are kind of St. Louis presence. I'm not sure if any of y'all, if, if there's any representation in the room, but we work very closely in different ways. Uh, most recently, um, one of them was an announcement, I believe it's University of Missouri with their engineering and biomedical engineering kind of departments working around creating what is essentially a makeshift accelerator that gets funded in different chunks of time by different corporate entities. And depending on who the funder is, is what the, the focus of the kind of particular accelerator cohort. And so the first one is being funded by a utilities company, and so the focus is energy. And the idea is to bring together kind of research faculty, um, researchers, faculty, and startups who are working around a particular set of issues that relate to that topic. Then, you know, six months from now, someone else will fund the next six months, and the focus will be another topic and the faculty will be sourced differently and the startups will be sourced differently, but there's kind of this idea of directly integrating those worlds. The other example I'll give is something that we're testing out here in Miami. Um, we're looking, we're about to launch a shared wet lab um, entity that is specifically focused on taking uh, things spinning out or kind of company ideas spinning out of the University of Miami and Florida International University that cannot be on campus for kind of IP and other topics that need kind of a cheap alternative that has a lot of shared research to come, shared um, research amenities to come and kind of continue that process before they're able to kind of afford their own space and go through the regulatory barriers of mounting their own lab. And so that's an initiative that we took on seeing a need and kind of a big gap in the community and we've been very fortunate to have both the University of Miami and Florida International University kind of engage with us in this way, even though it's a bit of a rupture to their traditional process. So we've kind of had to rally, herd the cats to a certain degree, but the cats have been willing to be herded. And so I think that it has been, well, we'll see how it goes, but it has been a good project so far. Cool, very cool. Uh, another question? I see another hand. Yeah. Where, sorry, I don't know. Oh, sorry, the podium, sorry, please. I know some of you have already answered this, but I'll, I'll ask the question one more time. I think each one of the engineering deans here want to have a Silicon Valley uh, next to their university. Uh, what suggestions do you have from your perspective? What should they do, the engineering deans, to create an environment like this? Please, Roni. <laughs> um, so I, I, it's a problem I've been thinking about for a while because I've had to go there a lot for, for funding and such. Um, one, there's a student culture of, you know, I'm a freshman, I'm a sophomore, if I haven't started two or three companies, something's wrong. So there's just a, a general culture of encouragement on the university campus. You have to create a, do a startup, and it's between undergrads and business school folks um, and professors. There's just such a fluid thing, like if we're particularly at Stanford, but also at Berkeley, of just starting companies. Like, of course you start a company. And it's not a weird thing, it's like everyone does it. It's like you get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, you start a company. So I think you just have to create that culture, it's very normal to start companies. The thing that uh, Stanford has that many universities miss are like hundreds of investors, like one baseball throw away from campus. You just fall all over and there's like VCs <laughs> everywhere throwing money at you. So you need to do things um, and be very creative. Uh, you could use like a, a suitable, they make this like beam presence or video conferencing or something, but get like Klein or Andreessen or somebody beg and borrow them to show up and have like Y Combinator pitch days to get your first 50 or 100K. Without some kind of real, I would say blue chip seed capital uh, to supplement whatever is available locally, you just don't get it. Like, like investors who are not uh, of, of the tech world and understand entrepreneurs and understand how to, how to nurture them and grow them, they just completely screw up companies. So you need to get high quality, uh, very forward thinking investors that you find on Sand Hill Road and beg them to put a little micro version of them on campus and do once a month Y Combinator days. Like basically the formula is create the culture of starting companies, create your own monthly Y Combinator with pitch days and beg at least five or 10 of the hundreds of Sand Hill Road VCs to just show up for an hour on, on a Skype even and you'll, you'll kick it off. I mean, it, it doesn't take much more than that, but. Uh, you, you know, without the, um, I would say, intelligent capital, uh, it's very hard. 
You know, Manny, just to build on that, we were talking earlier, I mean, about this idea of how, what are ways to turn, have more engineers uh, being entrepreneurial. Yeah, well, I, have, uh, I was telling Matt, I had a kind of a, it's kind of a little funny story, but I was honored to have uh, been asked to give the commencement address for the graduating class of the School of Engineering of the University of Miami a few years ago. And of course, you know, everybody's there, graduating, I come up, we had the regalia on, and I get up, I was introduced, I get to the podium, and I said, listen, I'm sorry to tell you, you all made a mistake, you decided to become engineers. <laughs> you know, so everybody's looking at me, wait a minute, isn't this guy supposed to be motivating us? <laughs> Anyways, and the whole point that I've made is, if you stay in that box, and what you've learned, what you specialize in right this second, you're gonna be really, really making a big mistake for yourself. So you really have to get out of that box. So you as the deans, are really the ones that can do that, right? That can actually, there's so many touch points. These kids are really, and today entrepreneurship is, is, uh, is easy in the sense that uh, they all wanna do it. Even, even the most stubborn ones. And you know, after, in the last few years as we've been investing in a lot of startups, uh, engineers are really stubborn, which is a very good thing, but it can be a bad thing if you don't get out of that box. Right? And basically, this is my product, I'm going to develop it the way that I want to, and I don't care what the customer wants. Okay, <laughs> good luck with that one, right? So I think teaching them, getting them to understand, you know, what a, what a marketing plan is, what a distribution plan is, just getting them away from what, and I don't care what discipline of engineering you're doing, getting them away from their discipline and, you know, exchanging notes and bases, you know, all around uh, what, what the real world is like, I think you're doing them a tremendous favor. A tremendous favor because you just be, they become a lot more rounded up by the time that they uh, that they graduate. Maurice, did you want to speak to what? If, if yeah, you I, were dean, what would you do to engage? You know, I, I I think so. First of all, I, I think it's a interdisciplinary issue. I think I think you have to go across the different schools and create programs, um, encourage curriculums. I, I think that that in itself. Um, getting engineers to understand entrepreneurship, for example, and encouraging that. So at least there's some structure within the university. I, I think that um, that's a good start. I, I think that from there, I, I think having a presence in a campus of a building or a, or a center where everybody kind of congregates and can communicate and can talk about ideas is a good thing. Encouraging uh, kids, as Manny says, to think outside the box um, and, and, and encourage that. Invite, like Roni says, the Y Combinators of the world or something like that. Prizes, you know, uh, Peter Diamandis has done a wonderful job of talking about abundance and setting up the X Prize. It is absolutely amazing how powerful prizes can be, even in a university setting and even not a lot of money. And I think just going around social issues, there's enough social things to fix the world that you could just start thinking about and solve these problems, whether it's on campus or off of campus. But getting people to think and having those types of conversations in a structured way, I think is a good start. Um, if I can echo um, kind of one of those points, I think the idea of creating centers of convergence that are you know, it may sound old school, but physical is really valuable. I think there, are, when you're trying to get multiple stakeholders to engage with each other, uh, when you're going to get students from different kind of disciplines to engage and faculty from dis dis different dif disciplines to engage with students from different disciplines and et cetera, you need kind of a physical location for them to run into each other, to grab coffee next to each other, to have lunch next to each other. You can't kind of the, the siloed and the segregation of the way that we normally study on, you know, on campuses, I think is completely contradictory to the drivers that we know foment innovation. And there's a lot of research around that and kind of the value of proximity. Um, the other kind of piece I'll, may, I'll, I'll say is on this idea of kind of bringing Y Combinator and such, I totally second that, but they're kind of easier rungs to, they're, they're lower hanging fruit to pick, and I don't think any university really, I haven't come across one, including my own, that really engage alumni in the way that they can and in the way that they should to use their resources, use their experiences, use their failures. Um, alumni are kind of ripe for the picking. They're usually excited to come and engage and tell something and share an experience, mentor somebody, advise somebody. Um, you know, uh, and I feel like we don't, generally those resources are left untapped and they may be a little bit easier as a first step than trying to get, you know, investors who have no affiliation to come and engage with X city or X university. We've got time, Dean, for one more question. About that. So, who would like to 
to close us out with a, with a question for our panel. Oh, we can have one earlier drink. Oh, yeah, we can hit the bar sooner. <laughs> See one. Right. Eye on the prize. So I, I will. Question. Do we have a question here? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, Ronnie, I know you talked about the philosophy of uh, staying in the Miami area with your company. How can we convince uh, the entrepreneurs that are coming out from uh, our institutions to stick around? How do we convince them to stick around? Um, what should a dean do, I guess? You know, which one? What should a dean uh, do? As graduates are going to, to connect? To stick around yeah. your university, right? Yeah. Well, the city, I presume. Where, where, where is your university again? Orlando. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Here, here's, uh, here's my take. I think, I think there's an illusion, this is gonna, an illusion of Silicon Valley. Uh, there's a lot of real stuff there, but everyone is going there. Um, and most likely what's going to happen is you and some friends are going to go broke in an apartment in East Oakland Bay. Um, maybe with 50 or 100K and your like, you know, Uber meets Snapchat meets something is like the 10,000 other pitches like that happened. So I don't want to discourage people from being entrepreneurs, but like sometimes um, where no one else is, like where is the blue ocean, you can actually make base camp. Uh, and if you're really determined, you might have a better uh, probability of success. But you have to, you have to be really like internally determined. Uh, people think, I'll just go west and it'll all happen. They don't realize how difficult it is as well, too. Um, so I, I think, I think there, if you're creating some kind of nurturing ecosystem, you might have better probability staying local uh, and getting yourself off the ground. Like finding 50 or 100 or 250K from someone, alumni, angels, whatever, to get off the ground. And then you go out west and you pitch, but like you're not paying a million dollars a year to live in some crappy apartment under a bridge you know, in Brooklyn or in this Bay Area, you're living in a pretty decent place. The climate's pretty good. There, there's some serious advantage if you actually do the entire math. Uh, you, you can create some encouraging. The total ecosystem uh, is actually doable. I have, I have some friends from South Florida who went out to the Bay Area and did that. They were living under a bridge, you know, in San Francisco, and they, they got funded, but incredibly expensive. Like, the, the entire cost of what they did was maybe 5x, 10x of what it would happen if they did it here. Um, so I, I, think, I think if you think holistically and if you're really driven and there's examples of people who have made it happen not always there, uh, you, you can encourage people to stay. But I think you also have to do the work of like, you know, you have to connect them to angel investors, uh, you have to bring the Sand Hill Road investors around, uh, you have to connect like other kinds of things. And uh, Orlando's not a bad area, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. I think if I may, um, I think people like to plant their flag and be taken seriously. Um, it's one of the things that I notice a lot in Miami and that we're attracting really interesting and exciting talent from elsewhere because they feel like they can come and plant their idea and other people will be like, oh, that's interesting, what is that? Tell me about your thing. Whereas if they did it in New York or San Francisco or DC or Boston, you know, people just steamroll over them. Um, the, the risk that we take with that is that we tolerate a lot more mediocrity, perhaps, because anyone can come and kind of plant their idea, but the, the, op the great opportunity that we get from that is that the, the many ideas that are amazing and that need a fertile ground and enough space to kind of engage and be taken seriously are considering Miami as a platform to come. A lot of that come, is the result of reducing kind of some of the difficulties of that. So is it more, is it cheaper? Is it more enticing? Uh, are there particular institutions that are there to support that? The other piece of that is making it, making it easier for them. I know Matt hasn't talked at all about kind of the role of the Knight Foundation in our local ecosystem, but I know that there was a moment, you know, a couple of years ago when Knight made the active decision to engage in the entrepreneurship conversation in the city. And, and you could see kind of the surge in energy rise because people all of a sudden felt like, well, I have an idea, there's someone to turn to. I can ask, I can t email someone, I can apply for a grant, I can engage in soliciting night funding for a project that I want to pilot that then turned out to be great, that then I can solicit more funding from other people to then make bitter, bigger, bitter, bitter, blah, bigger and better, and then launch my own company. There's so many case studies of, I mean, and I'm not going to take Matt's thunder, but there's so many case studies of, of things that have started with a small night grant to pilot an idea that had then become their own, you know, annual events or co companies or initiatives, and I think a lot of that is enticing because those people could have taken that idea and taken it elsewhere if they had not been supported at that kind of tiny first stage and felt that this was a place they could plant that. 
Thank you for that, Natalia. I really appreciate that. And uh, the, uh, I, I just can't help but wonder if the thing that we're left with is if you don't stay home, you'll be broke in your apartment in East Oakland. That was... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Dean, I turn it to you, but, you know, but let's thank this terrific panel. For... So personally, I thank Maurice, Ronnie, Mandy, and Natalia and Matt. Thank you again, guys. You did a great job. Thank you. Let's thank them again, please. Thank you. Thank you.